All right, I want to begin today by asking you a question. It's Bible quiz time. You ready? This is the audience participation part of the, uh, of the message. Who wants to venture a guess as to how many prayers of Jesus are actually recorded in the Gospels? How many times in the Bible do you remember that, you, that Jesus prayed? Not where it said he went somewhere and prayed, but the actual prayer that's recorded in Scripture. Who has some kind of idea? How many prayers are there of Jesus in the Bible? Anyone? Man, I don't see a hand anywhere. Okay. No one has a guess. Okay. All right. Um, here are some that you will be able to respond to. What are some of the specific prayers that you remember Jesus praying? Now, some of you have got an answer for these. The Lord's Prayer, okay, it's the most famous prayer that Jesus ever prayed. So that's obviously one, right? So where else did Jesus pray that you remember? On the cross. In the Garden of Gethsemane. In the upper room. You better, because we've been studying that for the last two weeks. So that's right. Okay. John, okay. Anyone else? Okay. Very good. Very good. So obviously we have these prayers of Jesus recorded, right? And it's already on the screen. So this is the official list, right? Nine prayers of Jesus recorded in the scripture. And so uh, the first one, uh, obviously the Lord's Prayer from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 9, 6 to 13, our Father who is in heaven. That certainly counts, right? Number two, there's the prayer of Jesus in Matthew 11. It is a brief word of praise to the Father where he says, I thank you that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent uh, and revealed them to infants. That's a prayer. There is the prayer of Jesus outside Lazarus's tomb. In John 11, Father, I thank you that you always hear me, right? Number four, Jesus speaks about his prayer to the Father as he predicts his own death. Very short line, but he says, Father, glorify your name. He's talking to his Father. That's a prayer. John 17, we have recorded what is by far the longest prayer of Jesus in Scripture. It is all of chapter 17. Very beginning, John says that Jesus lifted his eyes and began to speak. And from that verse all the way to the end of the chapter, 27 verses is the prayer of Jesus for himself. Remember, this is the night before the cross. He prayed for himself. He prayed for the 11 who were in the room. And he prayed for those who would come to faith through their witness. So you could say, that's where he prayed for us. Amen? Amen. That's John 17. Mark 14, we hear his prayer from Gethsemane. Abba, Father, remove this cup from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Luke 23, we have Jesus' first prayer from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Many people count Jesus quoting Psalm 22 from the cross as an actual prayer on the lips of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And then finally, Jesus' last prayer from the cross found in Luke 23, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We can certainly see from the Gospels that Jesus prayed quite often and that prayer was an important part of his life. The gospel writers tell us that prayer was the consistent pattern and habit of Jesus' daily life. Luke chronicles the prayer life of Jesus with these specific details. Follow this. Luke 4.42 And when it was day, Jesus departed and went to a place to be alone. Luke doesn't tell us that Jesus prayed there, but we assume that that's what he was doing. Luke 5, 16, next chapter, and he withdrew to the wilderness and prayed. Luke 6, again, very next chapter, in these days he went out to the mountain to pray and all night he continued in prayer to God. All night he continued in prayer to God. If you read the gospel at that point, you realize that the very next day he chose the 12 disciples. And then Luke 9, 18, and it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. Same chapter, Luke 9, 28. Now about eight days later, after these sayings, he took with him Peter, James, and John and went up to the mountain to pray. Luke 11, he was praying in a certain place and when he ceased, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And finally, Luke twenty two forty one, 41, and he withdrew from them a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. And that's Luke's record of his prayer in Gethsemane. Jesus felt the personal need in his life to spend as much time as possible with his father in prayer. He spent hours in prayer. Prayer, if not days in prayer. Again, the Gospels don't record that Jesus was praying during his 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, but what else was he doing out there? He was spending his time immediately after his baptism and just before he launched his public ministry now, he was there for 40 days before he was tempted by the devil. He spent that 40 days in prayer before his father. The Gospels tell us that he retreated to a place where he could be alone with God in private prayer. He spent considerable time in prayer before making important decisions choosing the 12, and at crucial points in his ministry. Through prayer, Jesus maintained his contact, his relationship with the Father. Through prayer, he received guidance for decision-making by determining his Father's will. And it was through prayer that Jesus received the power to work the wonders that he performed. And so it follows that if we want to remain in contact with God, if we want to improve our relationship with him, if you desire to know God's will and his help in decision making, if you need strength for living the Christian life, if you need power for doing ministry, and I would add this for us, if you need cleansing and forgiveness for your sin and power over temptation, the only prescription offered in Scripture is prayer. 
Luke has it that Jesus taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer after they came to him and specifically asked him to teach them how to pray. They asked Jesus, teach us how to pray like John the, the, the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. And I said to you not long ago that there were many things that Jesus did that were wonderful, but as far as we can tell, his disciples never came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to preach. Teach us how to do mighty wonders. Teach us how to cast out devils. As far as we know, the only thing they asked Jesus to teach them how to do was, Lord, teach us how to pray. For all their misunderstandings and mistakes, the disciples got this one right. They were wise enough to realize that the one area in which they were most lacking was in this area of prayer. They were smart enough to realize that it was in the place of prayer that Jesus received power to do everything else he was capable of doing. They reasoned correctly that if they were going to be like Jesus, the goal of a disciple is to be as much like his rabbi as possible. If they were going to be like Jesus, the one area in which they needed to pour their energies and concentrate their effort was in the place of prayer. Now, as disciples of Jesus, isn't that still our greatest need? As people who believe in prayer, are we not still a people who fall far short when it comes to putting our belief about prayer into practice. As individuals and as a church, we need to be a people of prayer and not a people who talk about being a people of prayer. I've said it before, but again, I don't keep on saying it. There's a very simple formula for spiritual power in the Christian life and in the life of the church. Do you remember the formula? Prayer equals power. That's it. It's really simple. But that means that little prayer means little power. Some prayer, some power. But here's the great thing. Much prayer brings much power. We will never experience the power of God in our lives as individuals and as a church until we settle this matter of prayer. Are we going to pray or aren't we? Are we going to give God the time? And it's important in church, it's important in prayer meeting. We intersperse prayer throughout our worship services. That's wonderful. The most important prayer for you is a daily quiet time. A committed time where you put everything aside, push everything out, and you get into the presence of God and you spend time in communion with him. A powerful church is just a church that's filled with spiritually powerful individuals who come together and God manifests his presence and he comes and that's because we've already done the work throughout the week of getting into his presence and spending time with him. What is the key to seeing people saved? Praying for them. Thank you. I said not long ago, and I said it to my life group this week, over 30 years of ministry, every time someone came to the Lord, I would ask them, so who's been praying for you? 
And every single one of them had someone. Oh, my wife's been praying for me for years. Okay. My mom's been praying for me. My grandma prays for me. I've got friends at work who pray for me. Everybody I've ever seen get saved always had someone who was praying for them. What's the key to experiencing an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and revival in our church, in our town, in our land? One word. Prayer. Spending time with God, praising Him, honoring His name, seeking the establishment of His kingdom, discerning His will, pleading for His providence, securing His protection and deliverance. That's what it's all about. And by the way, that's exactly what Jesus taught us to do in the Lord's Prayer. All right, so now we come to the prayer teachings of Jesus. And I'm more than a third into the sermon, and you haven't stood for the reading of God's word yet. Well, that's coming right in this section, okay? The most focused teaching on prayer from Jesus that we have in the Gospels is from the Sermon on the Mount. And so in Matthew 6... Jesus is contrasting the showy display of the Pharisees and the ignorant practices of the Gentiles. And he gives us some simple and straightforward instructions about how to order our prayer lives. And then in this portion, he teaches us the model prayer. And so this is the teaching about Jesus. This is the teaching from Jesus about prayer. And I'll ask you, if you can and will, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew 6. If you're following along in your Bible, we're beginning at verse 5. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they will be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. There's also another passage in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus here does not specifically mention prayer, but I think this teaching certainly applies to prayer. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you? 
who, when his son asks for a loaf, would give him a stone, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you today as children coming to their father. And we thank you that Jesus taught us that we can do that. That we can know you in a real and personal and intimate way. And we can respect your authority as a child respects the authority of his father. But know that you want and you intend to give good gifts to your children when they ask according to your will. We pray, God, that our hearts will be open today to receive from you through the word by your Holy Spirit truth to teach us how to pray. We might um, grow in our life in you and receive that which you want to give us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, thank you. Now what Jesus was doing in this portion of scripture, in the Sermon on the Mount, both in chapter six and then later in chapter seven, is that he was teaching us how to pray. And if anyone can teach us how to pray, Jesus can. He taught his disciples how to pray. He can teach us how to pray. In Matthew 6, just before he gave us his model prayer, Jesus said these words. Pray then this way. I think my King James says, after this manner pray ye. Jesus did not tell us to memorize this prayer and repeat it back to God. I was part of a church for many years. It was my longest pastorate. And we had a traditional service and we had the contemporary service. And one of the things that we did in the traditional service was we recited the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. It's just something that they did, that they wanted to do, that they took great comfort in. Do you know what happened the Sunday that I forgot to lead them in the Lord's Prayer? I just forgot. I wasn't being rebellious. How many times did I hear about that on the way? People going out of church. Jesus is saying here, use this prayer as a guide for praying. Listen to the way I pray, and then you pray the same way. So I think the question we should be asking is how did Jesus pray? In what manner did he speak to the Father? What pattern did he use? And so I want to suggest several ways of how Jesus prayed. And the first one is that Jesus prayed personally. He prayed personally in every prayer of Jesus in the Gospels, every one, Jesus addresses God as Father. He may have said our Father. He may have said my Father. He also said Holy Father. He said Righteous Father. And he even prayed Abba Father. But every single prayer recorded of Jesus in the scripture, he's addressing God as Father. 
And he tells us to do the same thing. In the model prayer, he said, pray then this way, our Father. In uh, Earlier in the gospel, pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. He tells us to ask and seek and knock, and his analogy is that we are children going to our Father to receive good gifts. Jesus did not teach us to pray something like, oh, great and powerful spiritual force of the universe. When you say, our Father in heaven, you are talking to someone who knows you intimately and personally. And you can pray to him who knows you that way. Because you can know God personally. God is not some vague ethereal spiritual force. He is not some ultimate reality as the philosophers like to say. God is your heavenly father and that means that you can have a vital, meaningful, personal relationship with him and you can talk to him the way a child talks to his father. In in fact, Mark has it, that when Jesus was praying in agony in the garden, he prayed, Abba, Father. Now, Abba is a Hebrew word, and it is built off the word Av, which is Father, and Abba is the name that a small child calls his father. Our English equivalent would be Daddy. And so Jesus, in this excruciating, agonizing time in the garden, as referring to Father as his daddy. Now, personally, I'm not encouraging you to call God Daddy. I've heard people do it from time to time, and This is just me, and this is my opinion. When I hear it, it sounds disrespectful. But notice what Jesus is doing. He is experiencing a time of very, very intimate, very personal, very agonizing prayer, and he is relating to his father as a child to the one who protects him and sees him through. Do you know God personally? Is he your father? Only a person who knows Jesus Christ through faith can say yes. But if you know Jesus by faith, you can pray and you can know your heavenly father. All right, number two, and this follows immediately the Lord's prayer. Jesus prayed reverently. He prayed reverently. Jesus' close personal relationship with the father and his intimacy in prayer did not cause him to lose sight of the holiness of God. In his model prayer, the very first thing he said after our Father in heaven was, may your name always be regarded as holy. In his prayer in the upper room in John 17, Jesus also referred to his Father as holy Father and righteous Father. He always prayed Reverently. Jesus understood that when we pray in the Spirit, we are entering into the very presence of God. 
the essence of all worship and prayer is a form of worship is when we pray, we are in the presence of the most holy God. In that wonderful passage in Exodus 3, where Moses encounters God in the midst of a burning bush, the Lord said to Moses, put off the shoes from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Moses knew that encountering God was an extraordinary event and he did so humbly and reverently. He did not take it lightly and neither did Jesus. He instructed us that when we pray, go into the solitary inner room in your house and close the door. Prayer is serious business done in the presence of a holy God. And we need, I think, to recapture that sense that when we pray, we are standing on holy ground. Number three, Jesus prayed confidently. He prayed confidently. He prayed as though he was absolutely confident of God's undivided attention. He prayed boldly, absolutely sure that he was getting through to God. He had the assurance that God was listening and Jesus prayed in faith. Believing that God was going to answer his prayer. And he told us to pray the same way. What did he say? Don't pray for public display, pray in private. Your father sees what is done in the secret place. And he will reward you. Ask and keep on asking, and you will receive. Seek, and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock, and keep on knocking, and the door will open. Ask your father for fish. Ask for bread. He knows how to give good things to his children when they ask. In all these things, he is telling us to pray confidently and to pray in faith. I love what Jesus said in his prayer outside the tomb of Lazarus. He said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me. Do you understand how important that is? He always hears you, always. Knowing that allows you to pray with confidence. Yes. In fact, there are at least four other places in the New Testament that talk about approaching God with confidence. In Ephesians 3.12, Paul says, in him, meaning Jesus, and through faith in him, we approach God with freedom and confidence. Hebrews 4, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of Need. Later in Hebrews 10, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. And finally, in 1 John 5, John writes, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
Anytime something appears four or five times in Scripture, they're making a point. Now, this confidence is not brashness. It is not born of pride. It is not selfless privilege, selfish privilege. It is not demanding or commanding. It is confidence that we have access because Jesus has opened the way. I'm being heard. My father wants to hear from me. He wants to speak to me. He desires relationship. He wants to provide for me. I can go to him anytime and he will stop creating other worlds to listen to me. Number four, Jesus prayed unselfishly. He prayed unselfishly. Have you ever noticed that Jesus used the first person plural in his model prayer and not the first person singular? That is to say, he didn't say my father, he said our father. He didn't say, give me this day my daily bread or deliver me from evil. He said, give us our bread and deliver us from evil. Jesus taught us to pray by including the needs of others in our prayers. We are to pray unselfishly. Now, certainly we can ask for God to meet our needs. But we do not come to God with a shopping list of things that I want or things that I desire or things that I think I deserve. What's that? We come to honor his name, to seek his kingdom, to know and do his will, and then we seek the needs of the community of faith as well as our own. And when Jesus asked his father to provide for our needs, even there, it was an unselfish request, give us the bread that we need for today. Right? Give us this day our daily bread. Take care of my needs for today. Not my desires, not my wants and wishes, not my Christmas list. Take care of what I need to get me through today. And I'll ask for tomorrow's needs tomorrow. That is a totally unselfish prayer. Number five, and finally, Jesus prayed joyfully. He prayed joyfully. He ended his model prayer with a doxology. Doxology, by the way, means a word of praise. The kingdom is yours, and the power and the glory forever. These are words of praise celebrating the wonderful attributes of God. You, Father, are the reigning king. You are powerful. You are glorious forever. He's deserving of our enthusiastic praise. Have you ever spent time in prayer for no other purpose than just getting into the presence of God and celebrating him and worshiping him and praising his name. I mean, you're allowed to ask for things. You're allowed to pray for others. Of course you can. But have you ever spent time in prayer for no other purpose than just 
praising and glorifying his name. I tell you, that is a wonderful time in prayer. Do you ever sing your prayers to God? I mean, we do that in church. Some, I mean, a lot of times our worship, we're basically singing prayers to God. But I mean, in your personal quiet time, do you ever just get into his presence and sing to him? It is a wonderful thing. It's great. The Bible says that the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. And I take that to mean when you start praising God, he shows up. Now, I don't have a singing voice. And I don't think the Lord minds too much that I can't carry a tune. And to help things along, sometimes I put some music on and I just sing some of my favorite hymns that are written to him. I sing them to him and I think the Lord gets glory in that. Jesus gave us this model prayer that we might better know how to pray. And I think we should use it that way as a model. So when we pray, let us pray personally, for God knows us. He knows our desires, and he desires for us to know him. We can pray confidently in faith because Jesus, through his blood, has opened up the way. We can know with assurance that he hears us. We should pray reverently, respecting the holiness of God and knowing that when we enter into his presence, we are on holy ground. We should pray unselfishly, seeking the needs of others as well as our own, and we should pray joyfully, offering praise and thanksgiving to our Father who is in heaven. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for Jesus who opened the way, who gave us access to your throne room and told us that we can come with confidence to speak. Because the holy God is yet our Father who wants to provide for his children. We thank you for that. We thank you that he taught us how to pray and that he taught us to pray. And I pray, God, for each and every one of us today that we'll be more and more um, motivated, perhaps even driven by your Holy Spirit, to build into our lives that private, personal prayer time where we get into your presence and speak to you and hear you speak to us through your word and that are equipped and filled with the Holy Spirit to go out into the world and live a life for you. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.